Welcome, everybody. Uh, I think we should get started. Uh, my name is Patrick Kajofsky. I am Associate Professor of Art History and Chair of Latin American Studies here at Southwestern University. Uh, we brought together four distinguished scholars and activists to present their work on border issues. Um, now, border issues, that's a broad topic, uh, and it has many valences. Um, but the presentations today and tomorrow will cover many angles. And while they are sure to answer some lingering questions, uh, they will also offer some new ideas. And as far as I know, this is the first kind of symposium, uh, at, at least this kind of symposium at Southwestern University on this campus. It arose from student interest in this issue, uh, which stemmed from our large Latino population and sparked also by recent news and immigration. Uh, as well as our regard for Southwestern's position as a liberal arts campus in Central Texas, so close to the border. Uh, the symposium comes at a time when Latin American Studies, uh, the program in Latin American Studies, plans to incorporate border studies into its curriculum. Now, this is not official yet, and I hope tomorrow to be able to announce the official change. Uh, let's cross our fingers. Um, but our goal is to provide a venue for faculty, students, and the greater community to share perspectives and to explore disciplinary pathways toward understanding what it means to be on the border. The speakers uh, that you'll meet today and tomorrow were recommended by faculty, and I want to especially thank Dr. Eric Selman uh, for his initiative on this matter. Um, the panelists were then selected by a committee that was composed of students and faculty together. And I'd like to give a special shout out uh, to our student committee, uh, Guillermo Alvarado, right here, uh, Torre Vasquez, yes, they're around here, uh, and Meili Crazies. Thank you very much for helping out. Um, we sought to form a panel of distinguished speakers who could express a variety of angles into border studies and who balance both academic and discipline and activism. Uh, you can, uh, hopefully you all have a program. If you don't, there's some floating around. You can take a look at the program for the schedule uh, and biographies of our presenters. At the end of each talk today, uh, we will have some time for questions and answers. And today's guests will actually return tomorrow for a full panel discussion. I want to offer a couple of opening comments about border studies in Central Texas and what this can mean to Southwestern University in particular. Uh, the term border, of course, uh, really most often conjures the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, but border is not just a geographic location. It is an embodied identity found within the United States. To be on the border is not only to encounter two or more in intertwining languages and cultural traditions, but more fundamentally, two or more uh, excuse me, but more fundamentally, it is to possess more than one perspective, to have an identity simultaneously between cultures, and to find oneself often between competing viewpoints and attitudes. In full optimism, though, we see this as enabling a better future, as the border offers a unique transnational perspective that negotiates between worldviews and politics and between history and culture. The initiative to add border studies to Latin American studies at Southwestern grew organically from student interests and faculty uh, strengths. But it is also a movement that reaches well beyond our campus. A similar initiative uh, has recently been articulated by our colleagues at the University of Texas uh, at Austin. In fact, our keynote speaker tomorrow, uh, Dr. Nicole Guidotti Hernandez, is associate director of the newly expanded Center for Mexican-American Mexican Studies, or CIMAS, at UT Austin. This center has advanced its role as an interdisciplinary department that includes much more than Mexican studies, particularly the growing demographic of Latino populations in Texas and the greater United States. We'd like to see this new shift as analogous to our inclusion here at Southwestern of Latin American and border studies. We have also followed the lead of uh, uh, Charles Hale, the director of the Teresa Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies, or LILAS, at UT Austin who in a recent article articulated a reformed vision of Latin American studies. For no longer can Latin American studies be an academic discipline shaped by the interests of, of the North, that is, by scholars who frame the study out of US political and economic interests. LAS, or Latin American studies, should now seek shared contexts of understanding uh, Latin America and the border in collaboration with activists and academics from within. As we develop interdisciplinary research and scholarship, and lead students toward a more nuanced understanding of these relationships. <clears throat> Our interest in the, in the border also intersects today 
with uh, that of the Paideia cohort, Americas North by South. Now, Paideia is a distinguishing feature of the Southwestern curriculum uh, at here. It is a plan of study for all students that uh, is engaged with the core. Uh, in Paideia, a cohort of students focus on a particular theme that is offered in courses across academic disciplines. The cohort and theme I'm announcing here, America's North by South, seeks to expose and analyze hegemonies of the North on the South and to seek alternative forms of knowledge that emerge from this perspective. The North here is broadly construed as the powers of the, of the Western world, including Europe and the United States, while the South includes those who have, have been and continue to be subjected by inequality and justice. This is not just the history of colonialism in Latin America, but also involves histories of slavery and indigenous marginalization in the United States and Canada. To those of you uh, who are part of the Americas cohort, I welcome you today. Uh, you can be sure it will provide some great food for thought uh, as you advance through your cluster courses and toward your junior seminar. There will be a reception at the back of the room today, um, and I welcome you all to stick around uh, and mingle as we get to want, uh, know one another. And that's not just for the Americas cohort, that's for everybody. Um, <clears throat> each of the talks today and tomorrow will be preceded by a short introduction from visiting and permanent faculty, as well as students, uh, so I'll leave that to them. As I mentioned, today's two talks will be followed by a brief question and answer session. Um, and all four speakers will be here tomorrow uh, for a full panel discussion uh, led by students and moderated by Dr. Selvin. So I now will give the floor to Melissa Quintela, uh, who's a, a visiting uh, assistant professor of sociology. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Hi, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jim Estrada, a nationally renowned expert in ethnic marketing and community relations. Um, one of Mr. Estrada's favorite sayings is, what you don't know can hurt you. And it's a saying that rings true, and one that is certainly true when it comes to the Latino market. He should know. He's um, he spent the last few years studying Latinos in the Latino market, and with educational credentials from San Diego State University, Boston College, and the Harvard School of Business, he went on to then build 40 years of experience um, with the Latino market in nonprofit agencies such as the National Council of La Raza, Texas Association of Chicanos in Higher Education, and the Advisory Council of the University of Texas Libraries most recently. He's also had uh, work in corporate agencies such as Anheuser-Busch, AT&T Mobility, Singular Wireless, Univision, Wells Fargo Bank, where he has honed marketing tactics for Latino audiences. In 1992, he founded Estrada Communications Group in San Antonio, Texas, which is now based here in Austin, lucky us. And he and his new book, The ABCs and Inyas, Essays on America's Cultural Evolution were uh, recently featured on NBC News, and he actually just won the American Library Association and the International Latino Book Award for the best political current affairs book. And that book, by the way, is for sale out in the lobby area at a special discounted rate for students and faculty. Um, lastly, and his honors occur really kind of far too fast for me to catch up, he's just been named Austin's Hispanic Male Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, by the Greater Austin Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So we're lucky to have him today. Please welcome Mr. Jim Estrada. First of all, thank you so very much for inviting me to participate. Uh, education to me is one of the critical factors in, in America and where we're going in the next few generations. And any, ta any time we have an opportunity to interact with students, to me, it's, it's a labor of love and something that I really look forward to, and today was no exception. We had a great discussion uh, with one of Melissa's classes in sociology, and then I had coffee with a few select members of the group who thought it important enough to share some time and exchange some ideas. So uh, thank you again very much. I'm also honored to be part of the speakers group uh, I'm not an academician. I'm, I'm, I'm a practitioner. I'm, I'm a marketing, public relations, communications person. And uh, the book is a compilation that took over nine years to write and is basically a primer, a primer, if you will, 
on the growing influence of Hispanics, Latinos, and Mestizos in the United States of America. So the subject matter, immigration, and its influence on society particularly is growing to such an extent that we have a lot of misinformation, misunderstandings of where, we're, where we've come from as an ethnic group and where we're going as Americans into the near future. So what's behind America's cultural evolution? Hispanic Americans. His, you hear the term Hispanics, Latinos, Mestizos, Mexicans, Mexican Americans, Chicanos. Uh, what is the proper label? What is the proper title for us? Uh, it depends on the generation. It depends on the location. It depends on a number of things of which many of us don't have a clue, okay? Latinos at 54 million strong in the United States are larger than all of Canada's 35 million, okay? So if you're thinking of a market that you might want to reach and you would consider Canada as that market, think then of a larger market that has a lot of similarities and characteristics that can buy your products and services, okay? We're educators, we don't sell. We don't have a marketing program. Uh, let me underscore that if you don't have a marketing program as an educational institution, you're in trouble. Why? Because the consumers that you're going to be wanting to educate the strongest force in the academic enrollment in this country today are Latinos. And if you're not offering them something that is uniquely interesting to them, you're gonna give it up to whoever does, okay? And let me share with you. Last year, the University of California system, the University of Texas system, the majority of incoming freshmen in both of those elite state systems were Latinos, okay? Not community colleges, not state colleges, but the University of Texas system and the University of California system. The largest majority of the freshmen, incoming freshmen were Latinos. Who are these Latinos? Well, they're anybody that comes from the Latin American countries. And in many, many instances, they are also people who have been here for a number of generations who can trace their history within the contiguous United States of America back to before the settling or the landing on Plymouth Rock, okay? My mother's family is eight generations New Mexican. So on my mom's side, uh, my dad's second generation Mexican immigrant. But my mom's side, because I like to use this, eight generations is a long time, okay? So part of where we, when you start asking us where we're from, it's important to understand that some of us have been here for a while. And why is it important? Pew Research last year did a survey. It found that over 55% of all Americans in the United States thought that over half of all Latinos in the United States are undocumented immigrants, okay? Perception is critical as we deal with this segment of the population. This is an interesting overview of the impact that Latinos are gonna have, not only in Texas, not only at Southwestern University, but throughout the entire country. We currently are in between these two points here. We're at about 54 million, okay? Of those 54 million, 10 to 11 million are undocumented immigrants. So even at, if you deduct the 11 from the 54, you got 43. 43 is still larger than the entire country of Canada, okay? 
So if you want to look at economic impact, economic impact, $1.5 trillion in annual consumer spending. If we were a country, we would be the eighth largest economic nation in the world. And we're headed north, figuratively speaking, that is. <laughs> you can see here that by 2050, we're projected to be in the area of 130 million plus people, OK? Now, why is it important for educational institutions to be aware of this information? We are the youngest ethnic population in the entire country, OK? Our median age is right about the 18, 19 years of age group. Sound familiar, <laughs> admissions people? Um, these are the percentages of where we're talking about in, in the next 25 years. I mean, that's, that's, that's a drop in the bucket in terms of time. Um, where's our growth coming from? In the United States, okay? The blue, it's not political, is Hispanic, okay? The population growth is dependent, is not dependent. It's going to be greatly influenced by Latinos in the United States. Okay, we're not going away. And if anything, if you're going to prepare for our presence, you have to look at the fact that over half of the nation's population growth is attributable to Latinos. Okay? Well, people say, well, okay, so you, immigration. Well, not necessarily. Uh, we do have a higher birth rate. Okay, kids to us are important, so we have lots of them. <laughs> Actually, we have about three point something per family, okay, uh, of children. It's, it's not, this, the number of kids that we have today are not like when I was a kid, okay? I'm one of eight. Uh, and in the agrarian societies of the world, children were workers. That's why we had lots of children. There's no truth to the fact that if we had 8 to 12, that we'd be saints and go to heaven as Catholics, OK? But migration versus natural increase is something that you should get a grip on. Because if we're going to be talking immigration here in the next two days, that's not where our growth is coming from. And with the economic impacts of the country the last few years, immigration is playing even less of a role. So as we hear people talking about we have to secure the border and you know we have to do a number of things to stem immigration into the country, I'm confused. Okay? And I and I'm you know I'm a former television news reporter. I covered these things for years. I don't understand how creating the fear of the brown horde justifies the kinds of expenses that we're making. But that's a political statement. It has nothing to do with the presentation here. Age, I talked about age. A fourth of our population is under 18, okay? We're the largest K through 12 population in the state of Texas. We're the largest K through 12 population in the state of California. New Mexico. Arizona, Colorado, okay? Those kids are going to be looking for places to go to undergo higher education opportunities. Who's gonna be ready for them? 65 and over. The white population in America is aging comparatively at a very fast rate compared to Latinos. Uh, we're young. And young means we're the fastest growing consumer. We're the fastest growing taxpayer. 
We're the fastest growing voter. We're the fastest growing workforce members. All of these things have repercussions. And if we get all the planets aligned as a community, we're going to have a tremendous amount of influence on the direction this country is taking. Perhaps not in North Dakota or Wisconsin or New Hampshire or Maine, but if you look at the top 10 markets in this country, Los Angeles, New York, Houston, Miami, there's going to be a concentration of us in each of those top 10 markets that's going to have economic repercussions. Who are these Hispanics, or Latinos, or Mestizos, or Chicanos, OK? Two thirds of the US Hispanic population is of Mexican heritage, OK? Should be very important to people along the border states. Because the Mexican population in the United States is creating a reinforcement of pride in language, in culture, and in heritage among those Latinos, those Mexican Americans who were born in the United States and didn't have the value of being raised in their own culture. Okay? There's a resurgence then on the part of Latinos in the United States. And I'm talking to you from a marketing standpoint. Okay? This is what I've been doing for the past 25, 30 years, is marketing, ethnic marketing, more specifically. And it's the fastest growing segment of the, of the corporate community. Additionally, ethnic media and Spanish language media is also the fastest growing segment of the media industry. Okay? Anybody have an idea what the top rated news network is in America today? It's Univision. In the top 10 markets, Univision has the top rated news programming in the entire country. And if you look at the top 10, and we'll look at that in a second, you look at the concentration, Latinos in 1940 were 20% urbanized, 80% ruralized in the 40s. Okay? Today, we're 90% urbanized and 10% ruralized. We've gone from an agricultural-oriented mindset in terms of economies to urban area-oriented uh, technicians, workers, and professionals. Where's the growth coming from? Where, where, what are the areas that are growing? This is interesting because as we talk about immigration, the number one driver for immigration in the United States is work, employment. And the states that have the fastest rate of growth are those states where jobs are occurring or opportunities are occurring. And that's what's attracting much of the immigrant population into the country. Uh, the Southwest. Aside from Nevada and Arizona, uh, have been typically strongholds of Latino population, pre primarily Mexican American population. Where do we live, and what is the majority of the Hispanic population in those areas around us? The light blue is all predominantly Mexican. We have pockets then of Puerto Ricans. Cubans, obviously, are very much aligned with Florida. But uh, Dominicans are very fast growing. As a matter of fact, this week, there was a report out of New York that Dominicans now outnumber Puerto Ricans in New York. OK? I mean, a substantial demographic change relative to the community. And I had coffee with a Salvadoran today. <laughs> I talked about the largest 
markets. Basically, these are the top 20 media markets in the United States. And what we do with media is we measure where we can get what we call return on investment and cost per thousand media costs. That's where most corporations, retail outlets ha that have national products and services focus their advertising dollars. If you look at the top 10 markets, there's another characteristic that you're gonna find. Those are predominantly Latino, Mexican, American venues or, or locations where we have a tremendous amount of population. Los Angeles is 50% Latino today, over 50%, okay? Uh, Houston, about 33%, a third. Harris County, Houston area. Um, Dallas-Fort Worth is becoming quite populated by Latinos. I, I think they're into the 20s now. Uh, San Antonio, obviously, is 60-70%. Uh, McAllen, 90%. So, I mean, in the top 10 media markets, these are not only the largest markets in the country, but they're also the largest Hispanic media markets. Something, again, that if you're going to put the word out, you have to know where to, you know, you got to fish where the fish are, figuratively. Latinos work, okay? There's a stereotype that's existed over the years about many of us catching a few Z's under a cactus tree, under a cactus, okay? Uh, ironically, Latinos do nap, okay? They take siestas, it's part of the culture. But recently, research has found that siestas are some of the best rejuvenating exercises and pastimes you can have in the workforce. A lot of the high-tech companies are actually putting in dormitories where their employees can come during the middle of the day to take a nap. So, that's an aside. <laughs> Labor force, okay, the red is US, the general US population, blue is Hispanic again. Look at where we are. We're in the workforce at a higher rate than our white European counterparts, okay? Do we make as much money? No. Okay, given, that's a given. But also how much you make and the quality of life that you lead is relative. Most of us Latinos will say to you, I may not make as much money, but I enjoy the hell out of what I got. And I'd rather spend time with my families and with my kids in an ungated community than have to have people checked in and out of my neighborhood uh, through by virtue of me living in an upscale location. Males, 76%. That's dropped a little bit since the economic recession, okay? It's probably about 69% now. But even at that, it's probably still the highest level of labor force participation. Look at this. Equal. Do we make as much money? No. Do we stretch our dollars? Definitely. Do we buy upscale, high quality goods? Definitely. At Anheuser-Busch, Budweiser and Michelob are considered premium beers. Okay, they're hardly ever discounted. And you pay the greatest amount of money for a beer product to buy a Budweiser or a Michelob. Okay, guess who we sell the greatest amount of Budweiser and Michelob to in America? Proportionately, Latinos. They will buy up, okay? Toyota is the number one selling automobile in the United States for Latino consumers. And most Latino consumers buy the upscale Toyota model. Okay, uh, basically what I, what I was trying to do is give you an overview. Some of this is repetitious for many of you, 
it's redundant. But on the other hand, I'm, like I said, I'm fr from a marketing background. And from a marketing point of view, we have a rule of thumb. A commercial or information that you want to share with people doesn't begin to take effect and sink in until you've heard it seven times. So if this is redundant, I hope it's seventh or eighth time you've heard this. <laughs> because part of this process is that we have to demystify the information that's out there about Latinos. Because if we do a survey of attitudes that we have developed by virtue of the media, the movies, the news coverage, we don't have a very positive impression of Latinos, okay? I still get today comments like, gee, you speak English quite well. <laughs> well, I went to some of your better universities <laughs> and competed with students in all of each of those universities. So I should be able to speak the language of this country quite well. Do, does everybody? No. But not everybody is in a position that most of us aspire to, OK? Uh, the competition is going to get stiff. And for you, what I spoke to the class earlier today was a topic that I've been talking about across the country for the past six, seven months. It's the economic argument for ethnic studies, OK? Ethnic studies is very important to us as Latinos. It's very important to us as African Americans. It's very important to us as Asian Americans, okay? But it's more important to non-ethnics. Why? Because you're the ones that are developing the outreach and crafting the messages that you want these growing segments of the population to hear, understand, and relate to. And if you don't do that, you as faculty and administrators, you're not going to have the ability to pull in as many people as you want. Those of you who are students in the class, in the, in the audience, you are going to go out into a workplace, into a marketplace that has demographically changed scads. We probably have had the greatest amount of change in the most compressed amount of time frame in the history of this country. We have people now that are getting information from a variety of sources in a matter of seconds. You, as tomorrow's workforce, you as tomorrow's professionals, have to understand the marketplace around you and how it's changing on a daily basis. And you have to become culturally relevant. You have to, first of all, become culturally aware that there's a change going on around you. After recognizing the change and accepting the fact that it's changing, you have to become relevant, culturally relevant. And following that accomplishment of becoming culturally relevant, you're on the road to cultural competence. And once, you've on, once you're on that road, we can have waves and waves and waves of immigration. All those people are not going to be as well-versed as those of you who demand from your colleges, universities, and faculty members an education on the changing ethnic makeup of this country. Questions, comments, thoughts, opinions, criticisms? Upset with her granddaughter, my coworker, because her Mexican was so poor, her Spanish 
was so poor that her Mexican American roots had been sort of lost, and she considered herself fully an American. So I was wondering, is there a point where you say there are no longer um, Hispanics in your in your marketing sense, and just more like Americans? Does that make sense? <clears throat> we have a model of acculturation that shows recent immigrants being the least acculturated to new Americans being partially acculturated to full Americans. Uh, I, for one, could probably be passed for a fully acculturated Latino, Mexican American, because I have learned how to be an American, how to dress, how to present myself, how to order, how to eat with the little fork instead of the big fork, okay? Uh, all, this, all the social skills you need to be considered acculturated. But Latinos are going to be the first ethnic group in the history of the nation that aren't interested in acculturation, okay? The story you tell happens to, a, it's anecdotal, and it happens to a lot of Latinos who wanted to acculturate in years past. They gave up their language. They tried not to show an accent. They started to dress differently. And they started to forget part, a lot of their cultural heritage, OK, on purpose. Why? To be accepted by the general population. You get further. You know, I mean, I had friends that took bleach baths, okay, in an effort to lighten up their skin, okay? And there's those women. I mean, you know what all the cosmetics are and what you can do with cosmetics, okay? Uh, but there's a tremendous industry built around lightening up, lightening up your appearance. Yes, the grandparents got impatient with those of us that tried to acculturate, okay? What you're talking about today and tomorrow, immigration, is critical because what immigration has done to the Latino population in the United States, it's reintroduced them to their culture. To, more importantly, to have pride in their culture that they know very little about because it's not taught in our schools. We're taught about wooden teeth in the pres first president's mouth, okay? But nobody ever tells us how did we happen to have San Antonio, Los Angeles. La Reina de Los Angeles is the name of the city. Uh, why aren't we taught about those things, particularly in the very early stages of education? We find that by the time you're five or six years old and you're educated in the United States, you're fairly well steeped in the culture of that country. When we get immigrant children from Mexico, for example, who have been educated up to the age five, six, or seven, they come here with a very strong self-image and psychological strength to withstand all the browbeating they get for not being American. So all this process, and I think uh, the other speakers will get into this at, at quite some depth, is that immigration is having some tremendous impacts. Are they taking your jobs? Unless you're working at McDonald's, you know, or are in the construction trades, or, you know, manual laborers, you're going to have a hell of a hard time convincing me that they're taking your jobs, okay? Are they taking your welfare dollars? You're going to have a hard time convincing me that people who hide from law enforcement <laughs> and MIGRA and INS are going to a public agency and applying for welfare. <laughs> OK? But somewhere along the line, we've convinced the general public, the general population, that immigrants are a drag on our economy. Quite the opposite. They contribute. OK, school districts. Well, we, they get educated free. No, they don't get educated free. They pay rent 
to a landlord who then is assessed on property values, real estate taxes. Real estate taxes are what pays school districts the monies for them to operate. So unless you know of immigrants who are getting free rent, give me the addresses. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's, there's all this, and it's so complex. It's, there isn't an easy answer to it, okay? My research went back to hearsay. My, gra my great, 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 great grandfather in New Mexico, they didn't have records. That's as far as, as I could get. But there's other people that are finding information that is explaining the fact that the trend towards acculturation isn't as defined as it used to be maybe a generation or two generations ago. Yes? Latino immigrants are growing up in places like Oak Park and Elk Grove and sort of outside of the urban core. So could you talk more about that? Very briefly so I don't get into, tell me what, where we are in time, time wise. Um, there's a new process or a new phenomena taking place in the United States right now. It's, it's the invasion of the fresas. <laughs> okay? Uh, are you familiar with fresas? Oh yes. Okay. Fresas, for those of you who are disadvantaged language-wise, uh, are strawberries. And, and strawberries in Mexico refers to people who have an easy life, okay? The I-35 corridor is more or less one of the fastest avenues into the heartland of the United States. Uh, Austin, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas has a tremendous influx of fresas. These are wealthy Mexican families who have left Mexico for fear of kidnapping, for fear of political reprisals, for fear of any number of things, and they're settling here in the United States, okay? Now, people with money coming into the United States have an advantage over undocumented immigrants who cross the border without any money. Okay, they are given front of the line privileges for visas and for immigration processes. Okay, there is a tremendous growth of middle class and upper middle class Mexicans that are coming into the country. Okay, but because they're moneyed, we don't seem to have the same problem with them as we have with the undocumented immigrants who looking for work. So the suburbs, we did a study in Los Angeles about 10 years ago. The fastest growing segment of the middle class in the greater Los Angeles area were Mexican American professionals who were moving into the upscale suburbs. Okay, the fastest growing. And by the way, speaking of fastest growing, the fastest growing startup businesses in America are Latino owned businesses. And within the fastest growing number of small business startups by Latinos, Latinas are the majority of them. So we have a whole new emerging group of people that are gonna start impacting this nation financially, culturally, uh, socially, so I, I, I hope that answers it. I can give you more information if we exchange uh, emails. Yes, ma'am. You're culturally aware now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, 
it's, it's a drawn out process. Uh, many corporations over the years, in order to deal with the emerging Hispanic consumer market, a lot of corporations saw the size of it, this $1.5 trillion projections, and they said, we've got to have some of that. Okay? So what did they do? They imported professional Latinos from Latin America who spoke meticulous Spanish. Okay? And rightfully so. We needed people who were good in communicating with the Spanish language market. The trade-off, when we talk about cultural relevance, is that if you haven't had the Latino experience in the United States, and you come from Latin America from a whole different class structure, you might as well be white and not speak any Spanish. Because you're going to have this. Okay? So part of the process is we have to start teaching people in the United States about the United States experience that Latinos are having so that we can become more, I hate to use the term, but I did speak to sociologists today, compassionate <laughs> about their needs, okay? And compassionate, in my mind, translates in marketing to dollars, <laughs> revenue, and profit. <laughs> <laughs> so the more profitable you want to become, the more aware you become, the more aware you become, the more relevant you can be. And the more relevant you, be, you can be over a period of time makes you culturally competent. So the process is perhaps ethnic studies starts in junior high school or perhaps even in elementary through social studies. But the whole idea being is that by the time you graduate from college, if you have not been exposed to the demographic changes that are occurring around you, you're going to have a heck of a time convincing someone to hire you so that you can you know, help them become profitable. And, and I use the term profitable. Even if you're in a nonprofit environment, you rely on foundations. You rely on decisions made by politicians to free up monies. So the whole idea is the more intelligent we become about our ethnic surroundings, you, the students and faculty, the quicker we're going to get to that cultural competence stage. I don't think you have to be Latino. I don't think you have to be from the United States. If you have competence, Cultural competence, you can learn things, but you have to have that key to unlock the mindsets of people who, for the most part, go under the radar. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. One more question. Yes, ma'am. My favorite subject. <laughs> uh, the political community in the United States, the people who set policy for local, state, federal government, also have to become culturally competent. Okay? We cannot have political parties throwing themselves at our feet for our support without the ability for us to say we want to select our own candidates, okay? And the political system in this country is set up in such a way that the Democratic National Committee, the Republican National Committee, will determine who's going to be the candidates. And then we have to take them at their word as to who's gonna do the best job for our communities. I'm sorry, but my notion is that people who understand our communities are going to do the best job for us. And if that means we have to start electing Latinos to represent us, what's wrong with that? <laughs> I mean, we've had 
white people elected for centuries. And look where, where we're at now. So give us a shot. Let us mess it up. Thank you so very much.